Guys, I'm so excited to uh, be chatting today with my friend Brian Starling. Uh, Brian is uh, becoming a really good friend to Katya and I with his wife Camden. Um, they're part of Global Awakening and have seen God do some amazing things, moved in uh, circles of uh, influence in the body of Christ where God's broken out in revival power, um, seen incredible signs and wonders. But the thing I love that is very unique in uh, this day and age that we live in of outpouring of the Spirit is the blending of healthy theology and the Holy Spirit. And that's what I love about Brian. And uh, we have been hanging out for a bit. And so I wanted to take this moment while he's here in Boston with our community here at the table just to get some of these unfiltered thoughts on a few things that I'm just going to chat with him about. Uh, so Brian, special welcome to you. Thank you so much. Thank for you so much. It's awesome um, to be here. We love what you carry. Um, and this is not going to be like super interview driven. I'm just going to throw a few thoughts out there and then I'm sure Brian will comment. And before we know it, we'll be talking about a whole lot of stuff. So Brian, one of the things that I love about you is the humility and grace that you carry, um, particularly in, in some of the miracles that you've seen and the signs and wonders that you've seen. So I want to kick off with just um, listening to a story that you can maybe share about uh, a moment where you've seen God really break in a miraculous power. Oh, man. Oh, that's tough. Well, I guess I'll go off uh, something very recent. Um, Brazil, if any of you follow the Ministry of Global Awakening, you're aware that uh, my mentor, Dr. Clark, the spiritual son of John Wimber, for many, many, many years now has been really pouring into uh, the nation of Brazil. Um, all over, probably more in Sao Paulo right now, I'd say. Uh, and I was leading a trip there, co-leading a trip there last September with uh, another friend of mine named Carter, and uh, Randy came a little later in the trip. And we were at this one non-denominational church on a uh, Sunday morning, I believe, where the power just broke out like crazy. Wow. It was almost kind of unbelievable, in a, uh, in a, even for those of us who were seeing it and in it a lot. Um, like people 50 feet away, you lift your hand and they're going flying and the glory is falling on kids. But that morning, uh, there was a man I ended up praying for after four or five words of knowledge that ended up being directly for him. And uh, he worked in construction. About seven years ago, he had fallen off of two stories down, hit his spine on a steel beam, severed it, and uh, his kids were very little at the time, like infants and toddlers, and basically you're paraplegic. From now on, you're never gonna be able to walk again. You can't play with your kids. And we prayed for him, and in a matter of maybe five minutes, God completely healed him. I mean, he got wow. up and, and walked ar around the, I love in Brazil, we have these very large stages and very large uh, altars and spaces of ministry. And it was amazing just to help him out of the chair and then watch God strengthen the muscles. And of course, all so much that God has to do to heal someone who is a paraplegic. And he just walked and eventually jogged around the whole front of that room. It was just incredible. Give us more, Lord Jesus. I love that. Oh, That's yeah. just incredible. It's um, amazing. So, I mean, I, you've been telling me so many stories about Brazil and the sense of revival that's happening, the breakout. Um, I, I've grown up in church, like I've done the whole church thing. I, you know, been through like, four successive outpouring through New Orleans revivals in my lifetime and seen God do amazing things. Um, it feels like the last season, all the prophets have been prophesying revival, 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 but it feels like a delay. Um, tell me, let me, get me into your heart and your mind around your expectation. Um, particularly because you actually are seeing revival break out in particular places and what we can be doing in this next season to be thinking about that. That's really good, yeah. So, I mean, Julian and I have been chatting a good bit about um, what I touched on a little bit ministering here to their church. Uh, it's an amazing church, The Table Boston. Uh, for anyone who gets a chance to come there, it's he didn't ask me to plug. He didn't ask me to plug it. It's just it's they're the real deal. Um, so we touched on this a little bit there of these two points of really a lot of contention uh, and so much debate within the body, even the charismatic body of well, is is this kind of boiled down to God's sovereignty or human responsibility? And typically, I found we tend to lend to one side or the other and suffer like most truths from the mentality of a pendulum swing. And we s sort of camp out on one or the other. And I really 
believe from everything that I've read and from experience and from chatting with people like Dr. Clark and others that it's not an either or, it's a both and married together. And so uh, two powerful examples of this I would say would be within two leaders, of one within the First Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards, and Charles Grandison Finney of the Second Great Awakening. Equally effective, I would say, in perpetuating revival, equally famous. Edwards maybe more so for the theology. Finney maybe a bit more for the stories of everybody knows of the story of him walking into a factory and the people falling under the power. And so despite how effective they both were, their theologies were largely polar opposite. Yeah. Um, and I think that's important for us to understand and walk in tension because typically we tend to think our way is always the right way because it's ours and that our stream is the river rather than I love I would say like in Revelation Jesus voice is the voice of many waters yeah. and I think that's a much more healthy robust view of and a view that I think holds some things in a comfort with mystery like we're not saying we have all the answers but we're saying you look at many things and you're, you see those elements of how provident the Lord is and you're like this revival stories, you see this tapestry of all these things happening in different parts of the world, different parts of a region, at the same time prayer meetings going on, then they're not in connection with each other, it's not organized by man, only God is doing it, it's a sovereign thing. Mm -hmm. But when that's happening, like Finney, um, contrary to Edwards, who is largely Calvinist, Finney was Arminian, and so he understood, okay, we're in a season of visitation, uh, God will show up if we meet these principles. So if my people who are called by my name, boom, boom, boom. Now Finney carried such a grace, when he did it, revival would break out. And so it kind of further entrenched him, I think, in that position. And I think it's really both. Yeah, I, I love there's a verse in Amos where it says, in the season of rain, ask the Lord for rain. Yes. You know, yeah. it's, it's entirely God who makes the rain. But if you're starting to feel just a little drop, you might as well go ahead and ask for more. Right? Yeah, I think absolutely. That beautiful tension of both of that. Um, so in, in terms of um, the world I've just come into in the American church and being part of what God's doing here and hopefully adding um, a value to what God's doing in the American church as a South African moving here, one of the things that I've seen enmeshed is this idea of Christian culture mm. and revivalism and the underlying thought processing of Christians taking over the world. Um, just yeah. give me some of your thoughts, because every time I read scripture and think about the kingdom, the way I prophesy, it seems slightly, I don't know, it just feels like the way of Jesus is often a lot more servanthood focused, a lot more low and slow, uh, and I'm seeing this dynamic and really wrestling, genuinely wrestling, how do we engage with influencing culture, not dominating culture, what is the result of revival? How does Reformation flow from that? And what, what is to be our posture in that? That's a whole lot, so just feel free to ramble. Oh, how, how, much yeah, time, how much time have we got? We, exactly. um, oh, gosh. Um, well, we'll definitely have to do some follow-up podcasts. Yeah, exactly. So, because that's, that's a book uh, or a sermon series, but oh, goodness, where to begin? Talk to me about your view of the kingdom. I think that's a great point. All right, well, yeah, I, th I think... I believe it was Dr. Mark Sharona who I think is, has said it in one of the best summaries, which is my perspective as well on, on the popularity of the Seven Mountains movement, it would be very ignorant and foolish to ignore culture. Um, I think we, we surrender territory to the enemy when we do so and we just act yeah. like nothing of culture matters. So it's not we're saying that at all. Uh, but, I, but I am very concerned as well and think that the Lord is concerned and actually personally addressing himself in a number of different ways and instruments of people that he's raising up. Uh, the, the mentality of shifting us away from the servanthood of Christ into what is really a, a, a heterodoxy, I believe, not an orthodox position. Uh, when we move from servanthood into domination, I think that's a problem. Now, the hard thing is we see God raises up leaders. God raises up people and places them in these mountains or uh, positions of influence in society, often in times of revival. You see uh, presidents getting touched in various nations. You see businesses prospering. It's actually an interesting fruit of many revivals is prosperity and business, yeah. joy to the people. You see God doing these things, uh, but what Dr. Sharona said is that, to boil it down to something very simple, 
that we should take the seven mountains and do this. And I really think that's, that is the leadership that Jesus modeled. And as much as we see transformation come from the fruit of what the Spirit is pouring out in the earth as revival is occurring, I think we miss it if we, if we only hold to a theology of where we're here to bring transformation. Well, many things are bringing transformation. The LGBTQ agenda is bringing transformation. Yeah. Um, so transformation, if it moves away from Christ as the cornerstone, I think is where we missed it. So my position is, I would say, is more of let's, let's incarnate Christ to the culture through living what he taught us to live. Seek ye first the kingdom, and then all these things will be added unto you. I think often we've kind of flipped that. We're seeking the all things added and yeah. wondering why we're not seeing the fullness of those things. It's because we've not put the kingdom as our primary focus. Gosh, it's a whole lot of fruitful thought there. I love it. I, I'm trying to figure out where I want to go after this because there's so much in there. I think one there of the is. things that I, um, I bear with a passion for, if anyone's uh, listening to me or following our ministry, is this concept of bringing healthy transformation. But more than that, this idea of the incarnational reality of Jesus. That Jesus had some flesh and blood. Yeah. He, in fact, Jesus has flesh and blood. He has a glorified physical body in heaven that is very real and tangible and can be touched and felt. And this idea that I'm seeing, particularly in the prophetic and revival circles, of it's all about what we need to get to heaven and separating physical from the spiritual, uh, spiritual warfare language, all that kind of stuff is so bizarrely wrapped up in a disconnect from incarnation yeah. and, and, and being fully present and um, fully in my body as body, soul, and spirit. Um, any, any thoughts on some warnings or concerns you have, particularly in terms of the current prophetic movement? Because um, a lot of people are going to be watching this, obviously, yeah. prophetic. Yeah, um, absolutely. First of all, I want to say um, I know that, you know, there's a lot we could get into about place of disagreement and place I think things went really wrong that I feel very passionate about I don't I, I want to say though that the Lord is so zealous and jealous over the role of prophet over the gift of prophecy and the function of the prophetic and what that does the the potential for creating the capacity for facilitating revival and renewal and all these things at the river of the spirit mm-hmm. um, so for prophetic people watching this, I champion you, I love you. Uh, as somebody who is not a prophet, but uh, loves hanging out with prophets, uh, the enemies, I think, has been really enjoying the field day of warfare against them. As much as I would have areas, of course, we could get into about the election and all these places where it went very wrong, I think they're necessary to address because we should always be a church being reformed continually yeah. in our theology. Um, because we, we, you know, we talk about glory to glory as from the revival standpoint, from the miracles. We also should do that in our knowledge of God. We should grow in that mm-hmm. as a people together. So while that's true, I think, you know, uh, we need to be careful to avoid, um, in the midst of the correction, places where we can have some judgment tucked away and be, oh, maybe I, I didn't realize that was there. And that's just as much for me. I'm kind of like, Lord, prune me, prune me every day. Uh, that being said, one of the chief concerns is a lot of things going under the banner of prophecy that I think is uh, just a masquerading of Gnosticism, which was one of the earliest heresies and has been a heresy that has never been dormant. Um, it's always kind of been there. It just You see this with really all of them. They just kind of come with a new mask in each generation. And uh, part of that, I think, is this this what you're saying of the tension of it's okay to be a human. Yeah. It's okay to understand that Jesus was modeling perfect humanity. And it's, it's okay to uh, understand that as much as Jesus is our model, we're going to be people that make mistakes as we're continually growing and um, becoming shaped and formed more and more like him in a process day to day, which process, I, that process word is I think very, is very pivotal for us because, and this is somebody who is a very fixing oriented person. Hey, Camden and I, when we first started dating, all most of our problems were, I couldn't listen to her tell me about a problem without, okay, solution, solution, solution. 
I had yeah, to learn I to listen. <laughs> yeah, I had to learn. You have to learn like, oh, oh, just listen to the problem. But there's process that's going on there. And so from a fixing oriented person, uh, I've really been more and more comforted by, I think I would pull from Oswald Chambers uh, devotional, the name is slipping my mind at the moment. Um, he says, with man, the destination is the end. With Jesus, the process is the end. And we lose that sometimes. And of course, we want the destination and the results of those things. We want that, oh, when I'm so as, as close to his image as I can be before you know, the uh, consummation of the kingdom and before our own glorified body and all these things, we can still want that sometimes, that that holy desire of wanting that can cause us to shun where we are now. Yeah. And, and we can end up easily participating in that facet of Gnosticism, which is the kind of shunning of our own humanity. You saw that within asceticism, uh, in the Desert Fathers and individuals like that. Um, not saying anyone's taking it that far, thankfully. Um, but that's one aspect. The other Gnostic aspect is, is this whole obsession with supernaturalism that's not Christ-centered. And uh, I would, I'll pause there and, and hear your thoughts on that. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, just to say, I think just that the whole phrase that you just said there, supernaturalism without being Christ-centered. I think one of the things I'm checking out in the world today, particularly in the prophetic, and there are say stroke some of the revival streams is this idea of being caught up in supernatural activity apart from the person of Jesus and I think there's something profound when Jesus reveals himself to Thomas and he says I am the way to the Father the gateway to the supernatural is in and be our being in Christ and I think that whenever we deviate that I'm noticing even um, in Christian context, what once was um, reserved in uh, practice and in ideology for uh, worship other than Jesus, um, uh, medical practices, um, um, breathing practice, all this stuff that actually come out of a very supernatural worldview that is the ultimate counterfeit and actually very antichrist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Being regularly accepted in the church. So I, I, I know we've mentioned this, and I'm really concerned that actually those are then becoming gateways and practice points where people can engage in the prophetic, quote unquote. Um, and I wonder if we're starting to see a bit of dilution of genuine prophetic grace gifts, because actually we've allowed a whole lot of junk in. Um, and anyway, that's my thoughts. I'm going to get myself into trouble for that, I think. Um, what, what do you think? Uh, well, yeah, again, to avoid uh, everything, uh, he's right. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I would say, you know, this, this just came to my mind right now. Um, we've, we've equated prophetic to prediction. Yeah. And the very nature of all things prophetic must flow from and go back to Christ with him at the center always if, if you remove that so these other things that we're speaking of and you're going into Gnosticism and you're going into the various other occultic things or demonic forms of revelation um, if it's not in Christ it's not prophetic we have to remember uh, Paul was followed by a very if that's a standard prophetic woman with a spirit of divination who is yeah. predicting things accurately um, the, the demons and, uh, knew who Jesus was. They recognized him. I don't know if I would say that the demons were necessarily prophetic when they would say things like, are you here to torment us before our time? They recognized him. Yeah. Um, but even in the recognition of who he was, it wasn't Christ-centered. You know, it, it, it's, um, so there's a lot more I could say, but I just, you know, we, we have to, again, and I know we're saying this phrase over and over, but it's intentional. Um, I think sometimes we, we lose some very sacred and holy things when we start to have a, uh, such a familiarity that, that any time we have then a repetition of the foundational things, we kind of check out. Yeah. And we lose a little bit of that original luster and awe. And when the, I think a lot of these things, God's wanting to rebreathe on that, those quote unquote simple things that are really the most deep things, Christ, the cross, the resurrection, ascension, sending of the spirit that Christ died according to the scriptures was raised according to the scriptures this heartbeat of the simple gospel and all of the gifts and the love of God and everything flowing from that foundation 
I think in this time for, you know, for getting into anything prophetic that we're feeling, I think that's something that God's really doing that gives me a lot of joy in this time and anticipation for, oh, what, what are we going to see in an emerging breed of people who earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, understand the need for the raw power of God, I think now maybe more than ever, especially if we're talking about for America, yeah. uh, the need for the power that uh, understanding, you know, I, I could be... I could, I could be the most incredible preacher. I could be a Charles Spurgeon and a T.D. Jakes on steroids. And if the only thing I can do is give a good presentation of a sermon, that doesn't bring presence. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't bring power. And it can't, it, it, it's not the anointing that breaks the yoke. That anointing is found in those simple things of Christ and the maturity that comes understanding those things and living those out incarnationally. And I think the Lord's really breathing on the stuff in this generation in particular in a fresh way you know you notice that now of course one of the things you have to tackle and handle as ministers too especially is how the enemy is perverting that amongst young people Um, but i think at the heart of it there's a burning desire for truth for justice and for reality Mm -hmm. and a lot of that the woke stuff i think is just out of a perversion of those god-given desires and people Man alive, I, th- I think there's so much that we're facing. One of the things that I love about your ministry, Brian, is the sense of hopeful anticipation of God's kingdom breaking in. Like your, the vision of a glorious breaking in mm-hmm. of God's kingdom, I, I thoroughly, thoroughly love. And I feel like we're in a season where God's about to and indeed is putting on display, particularly for a rising generation, what, it's, what he's like through signs, one is miracles, through the coming of the kingdom. Absolutely. Um, you know, in a, one of the things I love, just as we kind of come in for a little bit of a landing, are just some of the core um, values, lessons, maybe just two that you think, actually these have really settled my heart about the pursuit and expectation of revival, reformation, and kingdom coming in incredible power. What, what, what has form that in terms of internally uh, and settles that for you. Yeah. So you got, you, it, like if you cook, I'm sure they're locked, but these two things have settled in my heart that God will come in incredible power. <sighs> oh, that's, that's tough. Oh, that's, that may be that, uh, well, this is a challenge. You you're, you're, you're really good. <laughs> you're really, you ask really good questions, but then my mind starts going into a hamster wheel, <laughs> spider web. So there's so much I could say that I wave wish we had time for it. Yeah, we're going to have to do a lot more. I guess well, I would use two from just my own life. Um, first would be the example from, uh, from Randy as a spiritual father, and then kind of that seeing that happen initially within my own life. Um, I'm actually working on writing some stuff right now about the, the life of Elijah and Elisha because I was looking over that story again uh, recently in Dayton, Ohio, and noticed something I'd never noticed before. After he's had this cry for the double portion, he comes to the River Jordan. Elijah, his mentor, is taken up in a whirlwind. I don't know how many times I've read this story that most of us have. It's one of the most famous charismatic sermon analogies that their whole lives in that parallel. But I noticed there, he doesn't, when he strikes the water, say, where is the mantle of Elijah? I never noticed that before. He says, where is his God? Mm. And for me... It was part of recognizing, okay, you've, you've been with someone, with a general and among other generals in the Lord, men and women around the world, watching you know, these, these living legends of revival and, and heroes. You're seeing the way that the power comes with them, and it's amazing to be a part of that. It's another thing when you can begin to realize, oh, if, 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 if I have the same vision and love and heart and relationship with my father, that my earthly father and the Lord does, or mother and the Lord does, then you can rest in the fact that the mantle will come. The Mm -hmm. power will come if you have the relationship with God that, as Dr. Heidi Baker says, causes all that fruitfulness to flow from intimacy. So for me, those two things, watching the fact that it can happen with those who you honor and who you love and who you serve, uh, but that God also wants to do it with you. Yeah, come on. Yeah. you know, if I could say more, but I'll end up probably veering off on a lot of rabbit trails. But those are two primary things for me. 
Gosh, Brian, thank you so much. I just, um, guys, I want to tell you, we are living in the best days of, of history, the best days of the church, I believe, and the best days to see God's kingdom come. Uh, we are living in a season where it's easy for God to break out, that uh, we, we get to lean in because of all that Jesus has done. And one of the prime examples of that is Brian. I'd love to encourage you to check out what he's doing, follow Global Awakening, follow um, he and uh, Camden on Instagram or wherever, because I promise you, you will see stories that will encourage and build faith in you and consistently fill you with an expectation of what God can do. Thanks for watching. Hey, thanks for watching this video. It's part of my 12 session online school called Vox Day. Head over to voxdayschool.com to find out a little bit more about this and join us for our next live session.